What's up, Buck Doug with Dini in the Garage. I'm here with the DOA Chevrolet. This is gonna be something like part three of us trying to get this uh, completely dead on arrival 2002 Chevy Avalanche back on the road. Uh, it showed up at my house, motor didn't run right, trans didn't run right, major rust issues, no brake lines. I recently discovered fuel lines are like an inch away from going. So uh, what we're gonna do today is try to diagnose the motor a little bit. I thought when it showed up it was bad cats. That's what was told to me, having never been able to drive it because of the no brakes, it was hard to diagnose. You guys, uh, Chevy owners out there who've been watching these, gave me a ton of good suggestions that are way easier than ripping the cats out of this thing. So uh, it's pretty cold this morning and I'm not sure if the battery's still alive, but let's go try to cold starter, get her running, get her warmed up and uh, see if maybe it's one of the easy things because that would be awesome. All right, it's been sitting about a month now. The battery was holding the charge, but then it got real cold. So I'm not sure if the battery still got it. Let's see what we got here. All right, there's life. Dialed right in. Oh, she died though. It's not great. All right, it's idling. It sounds pretty bad. It's got some kind of knock going, but not catastrophic. Does have oil pressure though, so I say we're good. Idling real rough. Doesn't wanna, doesn't wanna juice up when I hit the gas. So there we go, you can see I'm, I'm hitting the gas. And it's just wanting to die. Now granted it's not warmed up, so we're gonna let it idle for a minute to warm up and then we'll start diagnosing these things. It's not fair to ask it to perform on uh, uh, with, with no heat in the block there. So I'm gonna let it run for about five minutes. We'll come back in. All right, and I've done very little diagnosing on this truck, but I really don't think this is a cat issue. There's just plenty of pressure coming out of here and this is at idle. I mean, so I really don't think it's a cat issue. Um, if you remember from the first video, it had a crazy whine coming from over here, which you guys identified as the fuel pump, but it's not even doing that anymore. So, uh, I mean, it's not up to operating temperature, but oh, at least it's been running for a minute. It's actually running pretty good today, but it's a little rough, like it, it fights it going up. So let's see what happens when we disconnect the mass airflow sensor. That's what all of you suggested should be step one. Now this thing does have an aftermarket intake. Ugh. No change right off the hop. Let's see how it goes. Revving her up a bit. Ugh. Honestly, no change. crazy this truck feels fine today <laughs> isn't that always the way there was a sensor disconnected underneath the truck I don't know what it was it was this one right here alrighty if this is your first DOA Chevrolet video I want you to brace yourself because it is rough and rusty under here but uh, here is the sensor in question that one right there on top of the uh, transmission cross member that was disconnected I assumed I bumped it while messing with the brake lines um, but maybe I was incorrect and it was disconnected all the time. If you guys know what sensor that is and if it would make this truck run crazy rough, uh, let me know. So here's where we are with the brake lines real quick. Uh, front passenger is run. The rears uh, were not blown. They need to be replaced, but they weren't blown. So they're not going to get touched because I'm going to have to pull the tank down to do the fuel lines and I'll just do them then. It'll be easier. So let me run the master cylinder lines and the uh, front driver lines and I'll get Eric over here to see if he can help me bleed this thing. And then let's uh, take her for a ride down the road with brakes, obviously, and see how she drives. Maybe that fixed it. That'd be pretty wild, right? I can't wait to drive this thing. It's been sitting in the driveway for a month. Alrighty, for any of you that live in the south or someplace else where they don't use road salt. You know someone from Ontario commented that they use beet juice on the roads? I haven't googled it yet to find out how, but that's crazy. If somebody knows how beet juice helps, let me know. Now, you'll notice this ridiculous wrenching pattern I have to use because of the torsion bar trying to get this brake line on. We're going to go over to my Jeep in a minute 
and look at an ABS unit in the engine compartment, which makes way more sense to me. Putting this down here, first of all, makes it a pain to work on, but you're also guaranteeing that it's gonna go out, you know? I mean, yeah, if you live in Texas, I'm sure you don't have this problem, but the rest of us up here, man, now, I, I got a uh, pre-bent stainless steel brake line kit for this truck. It was 68 bucks. Seemed like the deal of the century. I'm gonna say, if you're doing this job, don't bother. The reason is this. First of all, they're not specific to one truck. It's the same for the Avalanche, the 1500, the Yukon, the Suburban. And since all those trucks are slightly different, the lines are close, but not exact. And if you've ever tried to bend stainless steel brake lines, you know, it's a huge pain. Like right here, it gets me to the area and then it's like off by an inch and I'm trying to bend this little bit. So I think I would have much rather just gotten the uh, nickel copper lines and bent them myself. Additionally, they've got all these crazy bends that you're trying to bend through the frame and everything. Not the direction I would go. Those are nice and tight. Final thing, whether you get nickel copper or you get uh, stainless steel or whatever, if you're running brake lines on a, a rusty, dusty, crusty old uh, truck like this, uh, what you're going to want to do is around the end with the flare and the nut, when you're pushing it through the frame and everything, wrap it in uh, masking tape so that when it gets down here, it's not all full of rust and everything. This is what a 120,000 mile truck that was honestly not super well cared for looks like in the rust belt. This is what the ABS unit looks like. Let's go look and see what a 212,000 mile Jeep from the same area looks like with the ABS unit in the engine compartment. Now for context, Willie is uh, better, but I mean, look, there's a hole right in the floor. So it's uh, relatively the same shape. This cross member's all beat to hell. So obviously everything underneath is gonna get beat to heck. Uh, but the important stuff, like the ABS unit is up here. Look at this thing. This Jeep is road hard and put away dirty, literally. All winter it gets road salt, all summer it gets mud. It never gets washed because who can bother? The ABS unit's fine, man. Uh, I don't understand why you put something like the ABS unit on that thing uh, underneath like that. It's a nightmare to work on and you're just guaranteeing it's going to get all crudded up. Later on or maybe in a separate video, I'm going to show you all how to do a rear brake line on the WJ the easy way. I have the absolute easiest way to do a WJ rear brake line. People overthink it all the time. Anyway, Willie, you're going to get some love later. Back to the Abbey. This is my pile. These are the lines we pulled out of the avalanche. Oh, they're just completely gone. As you can tell, I mean, the they, uh, the only place where there's still actually lines is what was left up in the engine compartment, which further illustrates my point. I don't get it. Put it, there, there, there was room, there was room. You could have put it, look at all this room. Anywhere here, there could have been a friggin' uh, ABS unit. I don't get it, man. All right, uh, so we've got our front master cylinder line run. Let's run our back one, and then I'm gonna call Eric, see if he can come down and help me bleed this bad boy. Our cancer hole's getting worse. Every time I walk by it, another piece flakes off. All right, while we wait for Eric, let's talk about a name for this thing. As a lot of you know, I watch a ton of other uh, YouTube channels. Uh, it comes out in my vernacular. You got the factory from Vice Grip Garage. I've been loving that dude lately. Uh, tons of AVE quotes, which are always good. And one channel that I friggin' love, Eric actually put me up on it, is Zip Ties and Bias Plies. You guys have noticed every once in a while, I'll do a mint in honor of uh, old Peg, the, the Canadian up there and uh, one of you actually said like hey maybe the avalanche could be your slave lake which is his uh, I don't know what year but it's a 73 IDI f-250 that he wails the living piss out of and it's just awesome to watch anyway no avalanche I like the avalanche no avalanche is ever gonna be cool as a 73 IDI but I have decided to name the avalanche in honor of peg and his F-250 Slave Lake. We're gonna call this avalanche Lake Effect. Now, for those that don't know, Lake Effect is the um, weather anomaly that happens around the Great Lakes that causes upstate New York, parts of Pennsylvania, I imagine parts of like uh, Michigan to have um, more intense winters than other um, areas in similar climates, all right? And lake effect as this truck is from Utica, New York, where they definitely get lake effect. Like Buffalo, New York, you're about Buffalo, New York, New York getting four feet of snow, that's because of lake effect. Um, 
this truck is the way it is because of Lake Effect. While it'll never be as cool as Slave Lake, I think Lake Effect uh, definitely fits this truck. Uh, it, as many of you have pointed out, it kind of looks like it was parked at the bottom of a lake for several years. So, I bought this many years ago in honor of Old Peg. Mint! It's going on Lake Effect. Oh man! So uh, we're gonna warm it up a little bit with the uh, approved shop dryer here. Now I can't imagine old Peg would watch our channel. We keep it too PG for him, but if you guys are looking for some seriously funny stuff, go check out Zip Ties and Bias Plies. Dude is hilarious. Definitely not safe for work. Definitely not safe for the kids, but he is, oh, just a good old boy. Until I found his channel, I didn't know there were Canadian rednecks. Maybe that just sounds dumb, but I never thought about it. Gotten into a bunch of other uh, really good channels from the Great White North. Got a couple buddies, wanna shout out my buddy YJ Dave. Dave's from up there in the uh, Maple Syrup Republic. Oh, he and I do a bunch of chatting. Someday I'd love to get up to Canada to visit you guys anyway. Zip ties and bias plies on old Lake Effect here. The Lake Effect Z71. All right, let's make what we're gonna need to bleed the master cylinder in the vehicle. Gonna need something like this. All right, it can be made using the old master cylinder lines. Master cylinder lines usually aren't bad up top because up top's in the engine bay, and this will be just fine. So I made one already. We're gonna cut it. You could probably use a cutoff wheel. We're gonna use this little pipe, uh, pipe cutter right here. Alright, now clean it up a little bit with some, uh, there we go. Make it easy. Spray a little something on there. And cram some hose on the end, real simple. This hose really isn't the right size, but we're using what we have lying around today. There we go. Now, these are gonna go into your front and rear master cylinder ports. These are gonna go up into the tank filled with fluid. You just pump the pedal, it's gonna pump the air out, but not let any air come back in the other way. And that is all you're gonna need to uh, bleed your master cylinder in the vehicle, way easier than bench bleeding. Uh, so you're gonna take these brake master bleeders that we made and thread them into your master cylinder like so and then this is going to go in there nice and deep black do the same thing over here they actually sell kits like this but I mean, just make your own if you can. Like, I wouldn't go buy a brake line to make this if you're gonna buy it anyway, buy the kit, but uh, this I find is way easier than bleeding it on the bench anyway, because you bleed it on the bench and then you gotta find plugs for it. Just do it in the vehicle and then it's done. All right, you wanna make sure they're all the way at the bottom of the reservoir. Then we're gonna fill the reservoir with nothing but Wally World's Finest. Make sure you spill it all over the place. Then you're going to just gently pump the pedal and you'll be able to hear the bubbles coming out of there. Alrighty, after about five good pumps, I was able to feel um, the pedal get some pressure, which is pretty cool. So, now what you're gonna do is, kind of quickly, you're gonna unscrew one, put your new one, your uh, actual line on, and then you're in business. Yes, you're gonna lose some fluid here, you're gonna leak it, yes, you're gonna get some uh, air in the lines, but we're bleeding the rest of the lines in a second anyway, so, doesn't matter, at least now, 
the vast majority of air has been purged from your master cylinder, so you know you're good to continue. If you hold the line in while you're unscrewing it, it will not leak until you, the very second when you pull it out. And three, two, one, go. Okay. Alrighty, that's all there is to it. This is at least mostly, oh, that's the wrong way, mostly purged. Uh, definitely better than doing it on the bench, in my opinion. This is how I always do it. Uh, now we're just gonna have to wait for somebody to show up so that we can bleed the rest of the brake lines. There is that method where you use a Gatorade bottle and a piece of hose. That's not gonna work here because these lines were completely empty. That'd be a bit too much. It, it, it literally, this truck. So we get the lines in. They're doing well. We're bleeding them. They're doing well. We turn it on, see if we can't power bleed, speed up the process a little bit. I come over here and what do I see? A river of red. I don't even know how, but we blew through. The trans line gave up the coast. <laughs> this truck, man. Oh man, I was getting so many of you who were telling me to just junk it before. Uh, I imagine now those numbers will double or triple. That's the bad news, here's the good news. Uh, while it was running, uh, and I can't show you now because if I run it, it's just gonna piss uh, ATF everywhere. Uh, it, it, we started it up again and it was running real rough. I mean, real rough. Uh, so I came over here, pulled this, immediately evened out. So I think my issue, at the very least one of my issues, is definitely the mass airflow sensor. JTM has one, he said I could buy from him. So I'm gonna hit him up tonight, uh, see if I can't snag that off my good buddy. We'll put that in. Brakes are in. Uh, everyone told me to expect a fight, bleeding that brake uh, ABS unit, and they were right. It takes forever, and I like can't tell if I'm making progress, uh, but we're just gonna stay at it. Uh, Old Lake Effect has all the brake lines in her now. Well, not the backs, but the backs actually held those. I was really thinking that I was gonna be halfway through bleeding them, and I was gonna hit the pedal. It was gonna go all the way to the floor, and the backs were gonna blow right out of it. Anyway, kind of a bummer to close out another Saturday without um, getting any real work done on the DOA Avalanche, but, we are making progress, brake lines are in, so we can put wheels on it. I think, I'm really hoping that the trans cooler lines are simple. In theory, I mean, there's soft line involved, so it's easier to run. They just unplug from the radiator and then right into the uh, transmission there. So hopefully that's easy. I haven't even looked at how to do it yet. That's bad news for the Avalanche. Good news is now I can go work on the WJ, get that thing on the road, uh, which is mint. So leave us a comment down there in the squawk boxes. Let us know what you think about the build. I know you're going to anyway. If you like the video, by all means like the video, subscribe to the channel, check us out on Patreon, Etsy, and Teespring. Uh, I'm bumping our ugly Christmas sweaters hard because there's a super long lead time on them. So if you think you might want a D&E Jeepin' or Eric actually made an Avalanche um, ugly Christmas sweater, I recommend checking it out on Teespring uh, because it is like a three week lead time. You wouldn't want to get an ugly Christmas sweater in January. So that's all there is to that, man. As always, thanks for watching. See you next time.